Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've sort of been thrust into this role. You know, some people have ambassadorial roles. You know, they seek them. I've been thrust into this one, unfortunately, because of the death of my uh, brother last year. And I'm still in shock, and I may get a bit upset when I tell the story, because the other day I went to Melbourne and uh, Advanced Care uh, Planning Australia did a video with myself and a woman who wrote this book called Kelly Curtin, and that's available on the website now. It's on YouTube or whatever. I'm sure we can provide the actual details of it by the time we get to the panel. But it's three people telling their stories about what happened in their lives and why it was important to have an advanced care directive. In Kelly's case, and I urge you to read this book, it's a beautifully written book. It's called, uh, you know, What Will I Wear to Your Funeral? And it's about the relationship she had with her mother. And it's a very interesting story because her father died when she was 22, just suddenly dropped dead. So the family was used to death, but in a sudden form. But she said they never were worried about talking about death. It wasn't a taboo subject in her family. And Kelly had her mother get breast cancer not long after her father died. And then the cancer went away and then it came back 25 years later. So she's now a mum with kids herself and having to deal with the issue of a mother. And her mother said, I don't want cancer treatment. I've been through that. I don't want it. Um, so she, that's what mum wanted. And she had then had to work out how to explain it to her kids. So I'd highly recommend this book. Um, and you know how some people feel like they're an imposter, they call it imposter syndrome. Well, I, sometimes I feel a bit like that with this story because I wrote this story really to come to terms with the fact that Richard had died. And in our family, we had uh, two deaths, one on top of the other. And in fact, I've just met someone here who nursed my sister-in-law and I never had a sister, so I treat her as my sister. So we lost effectively my brother and my sister in the space of two months of each other. Um, and I'm lucky, I suppose, in the sense that I come from a family where we have two brothers uh, in the family who are doctors. Mum had five children, five boys, didn't have a girl. So that's why the loss of my sister-in-law was so great as well. She got a glioblastoma and died over a two-year period. And that happened just before Christmas last year, uh, just after my brother and his wife celebrated their 49th wedding anniversary. So we stood around with a bottle of Bleasdale sparkling Shiraz and toasted them and all she could do was just squeeze a hand and it was very very powerful to see two people so much in love but their lives were just being parted in the same way with Richard um, Richard was born in 1943 and mum lost the first child that she had mum met my dad when she was 16 she married when she was 22 she had a child the year after when she was 23 and that was in 1942. And that little boy died at the end of that year. And uh, then she had another child, Richard. And Richard, for some reason, we don't know what went wrong, but uh, uh, there were no antibiotics during the Second World War. So we live in a very different time now. So uh, little Bill got up, walked his first steps, and they took a photograph of him and he was dead by the following morning. So mum had to deal with that. And then Richard came along and Richard was just so loved by mum that she never quite saw that he had what would be today termed a learning disability. So we don't know what happened, we don't know why, but anyway, Richie was a mixed bag. He could remember every detail of, you know, every goal that had been kicked in a Crows game and uh, he could tell you that Mr Alexander had a Morris Oxford with wood panelling in its number plate. Uh, if you mention Mr Alexander 40 years later. So, and yet at the same time, he was functionally illiterate. Yeah, um, anyway, Richie was a wonderful brother. So I'd just like to read this to you because it's the only way I can probably get through this because it feels like I'm at a funeral. You know, I'm safe to say that, so, so, but it does. When you talk about death and you're up here with this, it feels a bit like that. But look, my eldest brother died last month. It began with a phone call. Richard's in hospital again, but he's only just got out. I couldn't believe it. Richie was struggling to breathe. He was sent to the new Royal Adelaide. I spent the next week waiting for the inevitable. 
traumatic events etch into our brains, I suppose, so we can learn from them. I can see the entrance of the new Royal Adelaide, two sets of giant glass doors in between a hand sanitizer. I put my hands under it, it whirs and squirts out some germ-killing gel to make me feel safe enough to head inside. Most visitors ignore the process and just walk by. At the end of the futuristic foyer, a woman is playing a grand piano. It suddenly seems like I'm inside some flash hotel. The notes are mixed with chatter, as jumbled as my feelings. I head down another vast corridor to the second set of lifts. Coming towards me is a girl wearing an ACDC Highway to Hell t-shirt, pushing a morbidly obese 50-something man who's bearded, tattooed, wearing a football jumper in a wheelchair, and one leg is a wrapped stump. His foot is missing. I think, diabetes? Then I think, is it smoking related? What about Richie's smoking related illness? Will he see another summer? He gave up smoking 20 years ago, but the damage apparently is done. He used to live with mum. We moved in after mum died, but his lungs got worse. The phone calls in winter to the paramedics meant he was having to be moved to a nursing home. He went in when he was 64. The average age of renting a nursing home in Australia is 84. Half the residents in nursing homes have some form of dementia. The annual mortality rate is around 30%. Richie beat the odds. He lasted 10 years in aged care. He was born in 1943 with a learning disability. Mum had no daughters. The last three sons were born in 45, 49 and 55. She called me the baby. The baby boom began in 1946 and there are now five and a half million baby boomers in Australia. My mind's racing. As I enter Richard's room, I know something's wrong. He looks pale. He's struggling to smile. He always smiles. How are you? I ask. Not too bad, says Richie. We plan to go to the Royal Adelaide show before all this. I said, I, I plan to go to the show with the Richie, not, 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 not the Royal Adelaide Hospital. I wanted to go to the Royal Adelaide show. And here's a laugh. He has end-stage COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I've learnt it stands for. I'm sure Richard hated smoking, but he got a job as a storm in an era when everyone stopped for morning and afternoon smoko, and he had to join in if he wanted to be one of the blokes. Well, now it's done him in. Richie smoked menthol because it was easier to come up to cool. Willie the penguin told him on the pack, and even when a cold has got you wheezing, the cool taste is pleasing. For the past 10 winters, Richard had colds and wheezed. This last time was the worst. He started calling, help me, help me, help me. He was put on morphine and tranquilizers. I fed him a bowl of soup. It was the last meal he ever had. He then lost the ability to swallow. Richard had made an advanced care directive, and so a palliative care specialist was called in. Richard had written that he was not to be intubated or any other extraordinary measures taken. Richard hadn't written these words, but he'd agreed to them. My brothers, who are both doctors, had worked out the words. So Richard lay there in his hospital bed, his brothers at his side, and there was no pain, only the pain in our hearts. One in five Australians has an advanced care directive. Because Richard had one, he didn't spend his last days in intensive care, being given costly and futile treatment. According to an article I read just after Richard died, we spend, or rather waste, $153 million a year on end-of-life treatments that provide no benefit. The new medically assisted dying law in Victoria will only affect a tiny fraction of people. People haven't won the general right to choose when they end their life, but we all have the right to say how we want our life to end. So have the end-of-life discussion with your family and your GP. Write down what you want. Three quarters of us say we want to die at home, and yet only one in seven of us will. And talking of wills, make sure you've got one of those as well. Almost half of Australians don't have a will. The number of baby boomers arriving in life's departure lounge means that the numbers of deaths in Australia is going to double in the next 25 years. So if you want to die in your own home, if you want to die surrounded by your family, if you want to die in a hospital and not an intensive care ward, in an ordinary ward, you don't want to be surrounded by machines going beep, then you can do something about it. 
If you do, you'll save your family an awful lot of worries and you'll also help save the health system billions of dollars. I learned that from my brother. So thank you, Richie. So that's what I wrote in the paper last year and since then I got asked to be an ambassador for advanced care planning, but I still find it very hard to read. So um, what I want to say is that because Richard did this, it brought us together as a family. It didn't sort of pull us apart. So the gift that he gave us was that if you do this, then you don't sit around arguing with your siblings in hospital. You know, Richie would have wanted this or he would have wanted that. And, and that's what I was trying to do in the hospital. You know, I kept on sort of feeling myself, you know, okay, can't we get him into the, can't we get him some, you know, and, and then the brother's saying, no, Richie had decided. And I know they'd had that discussion, but your immediate reaction for your loved one is you want them, everything you could possibly throw at them, throw at them, but it's not, Richie's gone. And it just doesn't seem the same anymore. You know, it won't, it won't bring him back, but what he's done is he's given us something that we can think about. So that's my little story from Richie to you, you know. And if he was here now, he'd say, oh, it's pretty simple. You just get someone to help you. You do it, you sign it, that's it. You know, Richie was just, you know, everything was all pretty simple with Richie. And some people used to say he was simple, but you know what? Sometimes the simplest things are the best. No, I don't want to be in a, don't want to be in one of those hooked up the things and no, no, I don't want to, no, no, no. No, if, I, if, that's, if that's what it's like, I don't want that, I don't want that. I could hear, almost hear him, you know, I don't want that. Watch too many TV shows and seen people hooked up to machines, you know, he, he knew what, what life was. Life was being able to get around, be upright, be breathing, being able to have a joke, being able to get on with people. It wasn't lying in some vegetative state being fed by a tube. And he knew that. He may not have had a high IQ, but he had a hell of a high EQ. You know, we went through all this and then literally, you know, the next month, we had the same thing happening again with my sister-in-law. And, uh, and she was a nurse and she was married my brother when they were at the old Queen Vic. You know, she was Miss West Coast, South Australia, you know, beautiful woman. And to see her you know, she was in one of those Miss South Australia quests and my brother just, you know, fell in love with her and he was a young doctor. It was, you know, remember those TV shows, Young Doctors? It was like that. She made, <laughs> made him a cup of tea and, you know, and he just, you know, thought that's the best person. Very strange in our family too, I'll tell you this, because they're all, they've all got, um, I married Lillian, my brother married Lorena and my other brother married Leone and my mother's name was Eileen. So get, <laughs> send, send that off to um, Freud to work that out. We obviously like the L word ladies, you know. But anyway, Lorena was the most beautiful person and uh, one of the people here today was involved in her end of life care. And she did the same thing. She knew exactly what she wanted. She knew she wanted to die at home. She wanted to be surrounded by a family, you know. So it was all made clear what she wanted. Um, and it's the same thing in this book by Kelly. And, and I suppose we go rambling through our lives thinking we're gonna go on forever and everything's gonna be perfect. And it's not. In our family, in this last, you know, that's in just six months, we've had two major losses. You know, I don't know where the next one will be, but I know that it's around the corner somewhere. You know, you know that the, the Grim Reaper hides around the place. It could have been me on the weekend. I've got a black eye. See that there? And that's not from the wife. <laughs> Although she feels like giving me one every now and again. But uh, that was uh, being down at Port Elliot. And I was just... Uh, trying to do something stupid. You've got all these uh, people that swim across the bay, you know, and they, and they swim across the bay. And I thought, oh, well, I'll try and do that. And so I swim across the bay. I got to the far end of Horseshoe Bay. I turned around to come in. And as I came in, you know, I'm a bit tired. And then I sort of get out of the water. I've swum about 500 metres or whatever. So I get out of the water and I look around and I see this big wave come in. I think, oh yeah, what you got to do? You got to dive through the wave, you know? So I dived into the wave and it picked me up twisted me around like a tea towel, tipped me over and slammed me down into the sand and smacked the air and I got grazed on my back and I, and I went over to the Surf Life Saving Club and the fellow in the Surf Life Saving Club said, I said to him, oh, I just want to tell you what happened to me over there. He said, oh yeah, that's where the bloke broke his T2 the other weekend, <laughs> Easter weekend, Port Elliot. You know, so I mean, that could have been like that then and then 
what if I'd been in a, a, a situation like that and my kids, and I've got a 12 and a 14 year old, can you imagine the two of them? You know, a hormonal teenager screaming and, you know, saying, Dad would want to be, you know, no, no, I don't care, I want him kept alive, you know, because she feels so guilty because she's been so horrible to me. Don't. <laughs> you know, I can imagine the two of them, you know, having a squabble in the hospital. Well, if I've written down what I want, then Mum can just say, look, darling, that's what he said. That's what he wanted. We talked about it. Remember, we talked about it. So, you know, it can be as simple as, you know, me getting on the push bike and riding home and getting hit by a bus tonight. We just don't know when it's going to happen. And uh, the beautiful thing about both Lorena and um, Richie, Richie knew because he had COPD that that was going to be the end stage. Lorena had a glioblastoma, so she knew what was happening. So they were given time. This lady, um, Kelly Curtin's mother, knew as well. But a lot of us don't know. But the, the message I'm, I'm just saying is in my new, you know, ambassadorial role that's been thrust upon me is um, do your homework. You know, it's not much. It's what we used to be told to do. Do your homework. Go home. Do your homework. If you haven't done it, do it. Talk to your friends about it. Get them to do it. Talk to your family about it. Get them to do it. And as um, the late John Clark, you know, who suddenly dropped dead, would say, I'll get out of your way now. All right? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. <laughs>